Well, man, thanks so much for coming on with me again today to talk about heel types, all the different yep. types of heels. I'm very excited because this is something that to this day still confuses the living hell out of me. Like sometimes I think I understand it and then I learn something else. And then, you know, there's a lot of conflicting information. Bennett stitched down. He did a really good write up on it, but uh, still there was, I still left that article with some questions. And so I feel like there's nobody better equipped to tackle this subject than you are because you, you understand like the nuance on such a, you know, granular level. So Mike, welcome back to my channel, my friend. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to I'm excited to flesh this out with you. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I've got a couple examples here, and I'm sure you do as well. So let's kind of get started. So, you know, the three basics that like everybody these days knows. Like, like there's gonna be three, whether they know it by what name or not, doesn't is relevant. But that's gonna yeah. be the block heel, which I personally don't have any examples of. Not a heel type that I do anything with at all. Yep, that's block heel, yeah, standard block heel, straight okay. up and down. Yep, All right. it's probably, at least for the new person to Boots, it's definitely their favorite heel. It's definitely oh, yeah. probably the most used heel. I, my Grant Stones are in the other room, um, but that's okay. going to be like, you know, the quintessential. If you like the Grant Stone look, it's, it's definitely the block heel. And that's yep. quite simply just a supportive heel that has a ledge that supports a shank and no extra material removed except for to line it up with the silhouette of the midsole. Okay. And I phrase it in that way because it's become important as we go into the next kind of heel that everybody knows and loves. Yeah. And I've got two examples of this here known okay. as the woodsman or the logger heel. Sorry, I do uh, shine yes. my heels up really shiny. So there's going to be a little bit of reflection there oh. with this curve. Now, the woodsman heel is done this way. Th this one's more of a kind of a dressy woodsman, whereas this one right here is going to be a more work style. So this is a pair of whites here. That was a pair of Tahuras. And the okay. woodsman is done this way for two reasons. And this is also known as a logger heel. Pacific Northwest will call this a logger. And the difference between the two is, generally speaking, a logger has a, a right here. This is called the, the breast of the heel right here. Okay, the breast. Usually it's it's slightly forward tapered. Now, this pair isn't because white sands it. That's why all the whites, if you ever get a pair, you get the Vibram sanded off of it. It's because they um, sand this flat. But usually it's got a slight inward cut and that's for logging gaffers specifically but okay. this right here is specifically just weight reduction okay and a little bit uh, is weight reduction and advantage walking uphill and downhill on uneven terrains so okay. for the reason i have no block heels personally yeah. is for the majority of people if you have any heel drag at all even slightest you mm -hmm. will find that your gait is much more natural with any of the tapered heels Okay. And we'll get to the other tapered heel. There's one other well-known tapered heel past this, which I have an example I'll grab here in a second. And, and and so if you have experienced a lot of heel drag, like if you take the bottom of your of your shoes and you're like, yeah, you know, I constantly have this edge wearing off, you know, like the yeah. sides. Here's a pair of Brian the Bootmakers. When you when you start building these deep edges on the outside edge, that's heel drag. Heel drag. And okay. People who have heavy heel drag, a tapered heel will always be a more comfortable walking position. It's just how you walk, right? Yeah. Uh, and generally speaking, they're going to find that significantly more comfortable. Okay. And just, just, it's just going to feel natural, whether it's in their head or not. The reality is there's, there's no science that proves this because when we talk about heels, mm -hmm. I'm going to grab an example I had previous here. There's two things that matter if we imagine there's a flat plane here, right? Yeah. This point should contact first. You should not be contacting on the outside edge. You want a nice concave bottom so the shoe rolls. If your back heel contacts first, which a lot of people get, especially in half soles like this, and it's just doing it improperly, and it contacts first, you're going to hit this and you're going to slap forward to your toe okay. and get a very convex feeling. And that's not going to feel good. You want a nice even roll. You don't want a snap forward, kind of like a flip-flop. So there's an equivalent amount of toe spring that's on the last. You usually want at minimum five eighths. So when we talk about flatness here, we want to see five eighths in that gap right there. Right. Okay. And then we want to see contact on the back and a little bit of gap behind. And that just lets you roll through properly. Okay. So that's kind of like the anatomy of a heel. And then, like I said, same, same with the breast line. Now, yeah, there are reasons why this would want to be flat or tapered here. 
for okay. most boots these days, that does not matter, right? Yeah. There are, except for one heel. I don't have an example of that heel, but there is one heel that does matter. So generally speaking, the anatomy of heel is based on, first and foremost, weight reduction. Why would you do a tapered yeah. versus a non-tapered weight reduction? Okay. And then the final example of a heel that is a common one people will see. It's Western these days, but this is a dogger heel, sometimes known as a Cuban, also known as a walking heel. And the dogger is going to be the one unique one that you'll see actually has a slight backwards taper where it cuts backwards. Okay. And that is to make better contact with the front because it's a walking heel. There's also another specific reason for it, and that is it is comes from the lineage of a boot called a packer which packer. is a western style riding boot generally speaking now these days we call the packer especially if you do specific northwest stuff it's just a model with a number two toe so slightly more well i shouldn't say slightly quite almond to pointy toe and that's for going through stirrups usually as a toe bug sometimes they call a toe flower and a packer heel which is the same thing is that is that Cuban slash dogger heel that I just showed, except yeah. for the cut is significantly deeper mm -hmm. and there's a 12 degree slide on the inside so that you stick into stirrups. Now, the number two toe and that cut are considered yeah. these, these days kind of feminine cuts, but that is specifically for getting in and out of stirrups. Like it's got a purpose okay. in mind. And all these heels have a, a, a work origin in mind, except yeah. for one. And that okay. is this heel. This heel is what's called a dress woodsman heel or a spoon bevel edge heel. So Whoa. if I put my finger here, you'll see what I'm talking about, where it's okay. the radius of a width of a spoon. Wow. This is like what your standard engineer would have been back in the day in the heyday of the engineer. It it, it would have been a dress bevel heel like this. It dress would not have. Bevel. Yeah, yeah. It's just a dress woodsman. It, it, it's just how people refer to it these days. But, okay. but it's just a, a, bevel, a beveled spoon edge heel or a dress woodsman heel. And this was real common in engineers. And it's just a look. Obviously, this yeah. heel is going to be quite heavy in comparison to a traditional logger okay. or traditional woodsman that's got a deeper end cut. And then there's one specialty heel that you do see nowadays okay. that is a little uh, more nuanced. And it has uh, been appropriately called the blogger heel. Blogger? It's a block logger. So basically, they take a, a, a block heel and they do what I just showed you with that dress bevel. And yeah. they do that same indentation into it to get a curve so that the top and the bottom are the same distance out. And there's a little bit of indent for weight reduction. Frank's wow. does a lot okay. of them. They're very popular with the Frank's boot community. Mm -hmm. Not something you'll see like on the website or anything, but you can always ask for a blogger heel. I don't have any examples of it, but it's very, lots of people very much like, it, especially if you're kind of one of an H&W guy mm -hmm. that's stuck in the lower arch stuff. Yeah, super common. And it's okay. it's just like the dress woods when they're the spoon bevel edge heel. Very tight. Not a lot taken out, mm -hmm. very much like an aesthetic look. Okay, I see. Wow, man, that is that is so much. Where did you did you did you pick up all this information like just from talking to like Franks and and talking to different makers, Nicks and stuff, or or like I'm just curious what where you were able to get all this information because I've Googled high and low and like I can't, there's hardly any of this like surprisingly it's scant on the internet finding a good resource on this so. correct no it, franks and nicks no they you, that's not where you're going to find stuff like this you, you're going to find this from bespoke boot and shoemakers oh, a lot okay. of my knowledge of this comes from guys like texas traditions lee miller uh, guys like gabard at creosote uh, yeah. girls like lisa sorrel um who's a famous cowboy boot maker out of oklahoma um okay. You know, people like that are who you're going to find knowledge like this who have, you know, because the boot making community, when it comes to like the bespoke makers, is very tight. They're very known. They get together multiple times a year. It is funny, too, because it's one of the weird spaces that in, in 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 the last 10 years, if you were to count the amount of new custom cowboy boot makers, yeah. nine out of every 10 new ones, there's actually a girl. Surprisingly, enough. oh, that's this, crazy. This, this space is very, very much filling up with female bootmakers versus male bootmakers. Um, so wow. yeah, Lisa Sorrel says every year when she uh, takes the picture at the big Wichita Falls, Texas thing that everybody goes to, it's where they give out awards. Ray DeWart just got his big award. He's a custom bootmaker, also in Guthrie, Oklahoma. 
And she's taken a picture every year of the, all the female bootmakers getting together. And it started with like in 1995, just four of them in this restaurant. And now it is close to over 25 of them meeting up for this picture. Oh, no kidding. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's like I said, that, that is very much growing from that perspective. Yeah, definitely. The more I talk to just different people and just explore Instagram and talk to guys like you, you're aware of like be essentially a whole other community. Like I'm, I'm most familiar with, I'd say the stitch down community. And, you know, I have like individual personal contacts with different makers that relationships that I've built over the years, but you know, then you introduced me to Frank at Frank's Boots. And, you know, there's a whole other universe out there of other makers. And, you know, you got the Indonesians all the way on the other side of the world. And, you know, you got you got Dennis at Custom Craft, who, you know, like all these new people just keep popping up on our radar. It's, it's almost impossible to keep up. <laughs> so That's why I'm super appreciative and thankful to you, because, I mean, you understand, like, I just learned that this this is the breast, you know, yeah, the breast line of the heel. Yep. If you know, if I'm going to be blo- if I'm going to be making YouTube videos about this stuff and trying to educate people, I need to constantly be educating myself. You know, there's <laughs> that's one thing I'm really learning is like, you know, like Frank Frank said to me, you never stop learning, and uh, I'm like, yep, that's 100 percent true. You know, and and the heel thing, I feel like I feel like this is a talk that needed to happen, you know, four or five years ago. You know, it, it probably needs to happen on a recurring basis because the heels are, it is such a, an important thing to understand <laughs> because I learned this from Rose Anvil. The whole reason for, say, a, for th- this is a logger, right? The logger yep. heel. Okay. The whole reason for the logger is, yeah, it reduces your stress as you're walking uphill. The Pacific Northwest makers really adopted this because they were selling to loggers, selling to forest men, you know, and so guys that were on their feet all day out in the woods essentially and so you needed that you needed that relief when you're walking uphill but then in addition to that you need a good strong pivot point to rest your weight on really like firmly and so that's where this comes into play because you could really dig that heel into the ground and get a a really firm pivot point to where you're not going to move you know so if you're like pulling really big branches or logs or something you need to be grounded you know firmly and you know back in the day they didn't have all the at least i don't think they didn't have all the fancy lug commando soles 21 1921 was the first uh, commando oh no shit wow mm-hmm. yeah it's, it's actually for climbers the guy who invented vibram had multiple friends die rock climbing with leather heels so the commando was the sole he made to combat that okay well there, there's the my first ding against leather soles, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, I, hey, leather soles have the purpose. They're they're quite good. They serve their purpose, but they are very much a not blue collar sole. They are are the you know blue collar to white collar person's you know footwear of choice. I a lot of people just don't like them, quite frankly, just because of the click they make on hard floors. It, yeah. it, it we associate that with a very feminine sound these days it reminds them of like high heels clicking on a floor which is yeah. funny because if you were to take a heel like of this size mm-hmm. and not taper it not only would it be heavy it would be the most like like most people are gonna be like oh that's a feminine girly looking heel yeah uh, if i made that a block heel that would be the most feminine girly looking heel you'd think it would look like one of the platform shoes you see them wear out of something like hot topic definitely you're so, right <laughs> people are usually have a misconception of like ah you know block heel manly Tapered yeah. heels, feminine. But if you did the correct height versions of them, uh, the block yeah. heel would be the most feminine of all of them. Right, right, that makes sense. And actually, it's funny you you bring that up because I think yeah, I think the the strike the 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 strike of your of your foot on the ground it 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 does these days have more of a feminine I guess association. But it's funny when I was in boot camp, I remember the it was like it was notorious amongst like the really really mean drill sergeants they would actually instead of getting toe tips installed on the on the toe i think they'd get them installed on the heel of their boot so that as they walked that metal would clank against the ground and it would just strike even more terror into our hearts when we'd hear it like oh shit (laughs) yeah you know that people do that and there's actually an even better one you can get called a marching shoe which is essentially a horseshoe that goes on the bottom that the entire heel will make noise when you, when you step with it. 
it's very common for like the uh, British Royal Air Force to have them for, you know, the displays they do on a regular basis. A lot okay. of them will have marching boots that specifically have hobnails and marching heels on them okay. to make more noise as they march. That makes sense. Wow. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. And, and it, it's literally a horseshoe. It looks just like a horseshoe. It even okay. uses horse farrier style horseshoe nails. Interesting. It, it's intimidating. I mean, when you hear it, it's like, whoa, <laughs> here come like the, the war drums, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. So I kind of wanted, I, I gathered up some of my boots and I kind of wanted to just show you and just get your thoughts. These are my crap. What, what's the name? Backstay, it looks like Fortis. Based on what I saw, yes, as you... yes. these are my Fortis, my one and only pair of Fortis. We've got Mushio horse rump and olive horse rump here. Beautiful build, two toned, but yes. Th so this is going to be a Fortis boot, and uh, so what do you think about that breast there? Can you see it all right? Mm -hmm. yep. Adjust the lights. Yep. So it, it okay. that that one's got what you would consider a traditional logger that's got a slight forward upcut. It doesn't look like it because they set the heel just a little too far forward when they put it oh, on. Okay. But it, it that's that has a forward cut. So there's three reasons why the logger is done the way it's done. Um, okay. you, you touched on the first one, leverage when you're walking uphill. But another big one is um, if I hold it like this and I put it yep. this way and you see that thing, if I'm sitting on a hill on the side, this way with my toe raised more, I'm getting full contact with my heel going uphill. That's okay. the reason for this taper on the back end right here. So if you yeah. look like if I level this down and you see that there's that gap there, I know it's probably very hard to see on camera, but there's a gap there. If you do it with your boots at home, you'll see. And that's why that is there is so okay. that when you're like this walking mm -hmm. uphill, you're getting full contact with the heel. Okay. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. And then this, these are my Bordones in stone waxy Mohawk and uh, on the site that think... is that's a blogger heel so that's what i was talking about with the blogger okay. heel see how it makes that curve in the middle but the top and the bottom are the same they might not have meant to do that on purpose maybe they did but that's what i mean by blogger heel usually you'll go in just a little bit deeper to exacerbate it but if you put okay. your finger on the side you'll see that there is very much a slight spoon curve there okay gotcha yeah right there perfect you can see exactly what i'm talking about there that that is a blogger heel at the end of the day cool. that is that that's what the blogger is so oh. hey, say you had an example of something I, I don't have. I, mean, I, don't, I don't usually do block heels, but that that's like I said, that that may or may not have been done by mistake. A lot of people do it just based on what sanding equipment they're using. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, just, it just depends on like, you know, what kind of equipment you have around. You know, traditionally, most shoe work is done with a Landis Sutton machine. They were okay. originally two separate companies. They became one company. And that's that machine you see where you got like the two belt sanders and then the extraction at the bottom. If you've ever seen a... Yeah. Yeah. A Beto's Leatherwork, a Nick's, a Frank's, anybody or like Baker's Shoe, which is Baker's Boots out of Eugene, Oregon. They do videos of their own workshop and stuff. It, it, you'll see everyone using essentially this machine because you can use it without any respiration or any protective respiratory stuff. So no no mask, no canister style filter, nothing that you would need to, in terms of filtration. Cool. Because the machine itself has such strong suction, it pulls all those particles in. So hey, that's usually, you know, a four inch wide belt. So you're going to get a lot of the same heel profiles on it. So like oh. when they do the blogger, they actually do it with the finisher, the, the, that, that palm swell finisher that's on the top. Yeah. It's how they put the blogger in it. Like Frank's not with the belt itself. Okay. Very cool. Um, so where, where is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is the logger and the uh, dogger heels could very easily be done with the four inch belt. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to get it on the. Yeah, no, I, yeah, it, it like I said, it, it should have been, it's been very visible a couple times. It, 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 yeah, you, you definitely nailed it with whatever that blue thing is. It looks like a letter opener. <laughs> this is the most random thing. I just got this in the mail. It's <laughs> yeah. veterans of foreign wars. I, yeah. they sent me this big package of stuff. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have got the wrong name. <laughs> yeah, probably. I'm like, what? Why, why are you sending me? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I probably added my my information to some some somewhere for veterans, and then I'm on a list now to get receive stuff. So yeah, pretty cool. But yep. so I, so that that's like the 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 coolness of that. Another super unique story about this is if we go to the dogger heel, which oh. hands down this is my favorite heel. By the way, like almost all my boots 
yeah. or, or a dogger variation of some kind. The, this is also known as a Cuban heel. Okay. But it has nothing yeah. to do with the country of Cuba. Okay. Right. So the Cuban heel is commonly considered to be a misconception. Uh-huh. It's actually supposed to be a Cubine heel, not a Cuban Cubine. heel. That's right. Um, John Cubine was a cowboy bootmaker in Coffeyville, Kansas in the 1870s. He's known okay. as the he known for kind of inventing and making the Coffeyville style boot. And the thought process is, is if you look at those styles, and you could Google it, Coffeyville style boot does bring stuff up. You see a dogger heel. So it's actually thought to be a Cubine heel, not a Cuban heel. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Now, Coffeyville is this really weird town in, in Southeast Kansas. Um, been through a number of times, actually just drove through it last weekend. Oh. Um, it's only like eight or 9,000 people. It's, it's basically been, it's, it's grown, it's went from 30,000 people in like the 1920s and 30s down to the 8,000 people that are left now. Wow. There's some industry there, but it's just kind of a mill in Nora, Kansas town, but it was really uh, important trade post back in the 1870s during the Cowtown days. Okay. It, it, it was it was the last stop because the way Oklahoma's geography works, they would go up into Coffeyville over to Wichita to get to the um, railroad to get up to the Transcontinental Railroad with their cows. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Wow. So Wichita's cow town. Coffeyville is a big trading post in cow town. There's a there's a matching Oklahoma town in that area. But when you drive through that part of of uh, Kansas, you're going to see a lot of like old route 66 s stuff because it's not quite on route 66 but it's close enough that there's because it, it's a little debated what route 66 actually is but a lot of there th- there's that kind of like that route 66 era stuff that was built there and then there's older stuff you always know when you go into a town and see a very fancy like ornate brick building that like yeah. someone's using as like a shoe store or something it's like that was a bank back in the wild west right <laughs> you could always tell <laughs> much blood was shed Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you, well, you drive through some of these small towns like Winfield, Kansas, which is, you know, on that way to Coffeyville from like the Wichita area. You see this too. You drive through Winfield and even now the banks kept all those buildings. So you drive through downtown Winfield and there's like eight or nine banks because it's a farming town and like a restaurant. And it's like, let's really get all the money here. Right. <laughs> oh, the, the more questions you ask, the more questions you'll have. I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so the, the, the Cuban heel is actually the Cubine heel. It's, okay. It's, yes. it's it has nothing to do with the country of Cuba. No, yeah. no relevance whatsoever <laughs> with any other country or anything else. It, it was it was Cubine heel, and it was just translated wrong at some point. And the thing is, no one's actually sure if Cubine is the way you spell it. It's, we just know it's Q U B I N E. Okay. It, it might have had a different pronunciation. We're, no one's really quite sure. Interesting, man. That that really just. Blew, blew my mind when you told me that you know a few weeks ago and i'm really glad you remembered to bring that up for this video because yeah that's something that that'll that'll that's a misconception because it's just based on the sheer fact that it's called cuban you know cuban cigars cuban tobacco cuban you know we just assume that the cuban heel, heel would have also originated in cuba but no no not at all so would you consider so these are my thursday jodhpurs that that's considered a, a a Cuban slash dogger. It is a very very light. I usually you cut yep. in a little deeper than that, but yes, that that is technically a Cuban technically heel, a Cuban mm. slash dogger heel. Now, yep. is there a distinction between dogger and Cuban? Not really. But the biggest thing you'll notice is, generally speaking, a dogger is going to have a little bit of a curve under it. Okay. A a Cuban because it's a cowboy boot heel should be flat now yours is curved most yeah. people are going to do it curved these days because everyone yeah. uses the same pre-made heel bases unless it's an indonesian pair okay i don't have one that's straight but traditionally speaking it should have been straight right okay and, and okay. it's quite simply to sit in stirrups because the packer is straight in the same way okay very cool and and the idea behind the cubine heel was it's it was a heel that you could walk on yeah and ride in kind of a, you know the first step of like a versatile heel because oh. a packer heel which is shaped the exact same is a dogger so a packer heel right is going to oh. be it, it, this this is this is a i don't have a packer heel but like imagine this being a packer you're going to okay. take this heel almost a whole size down so this is a 12 you're going to go all the way down to a 10 so it's okay. going to come in quite a bit it's going to come in both directions quite a bit and then this angle right here 
mm-hmm. instead of being this nice round 22 degree angle, it's going to be closer to a 37 degree angle. Okay. All the way to there. And it's going to make this heel like it's going to have the least amount of contact of all the heels on the ground. And they're not always the funnest to walk in. So the idea behind the Cubine heel or the Cuban heel was how do we walk in it plus be able to still ride in it? So here we go. Here are my <laughs> Nick's slash Nobleman's Apoth carry. Ah, uh, that's apothecary. that's still a dogger. It's that's not, dogger. it's not, okay. yeah, it's not quite small enough to be a packer. Like, I let me see if I can find an example here. I, I, the packer heel is going to be very, very tight. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. I, I, I'm, I'm finding a picture. Give me just a second here. Okay. Yeah. I could, and all I could edit it into the video over the, let's see. For it. I know I've got a picture of this somewhere. I wonder if that would be it. That that is it. Yeah. See, I must got a much deeper cut on it, and it could yeah. go even deeper than that. I was trying to get a good example of that, but yes, that that's the Packer heel there. Okay. And it's okay. it's it's a pretty as you can see, it's quite a deep cut. Yeah. Like it, Compared. Mm-hmm. And and once again, it very much related to cowboy boot riding. Okay, that makes sense. Like like stirrups are the big reason behind that. And so for the. For the layperson who is not a cowboy, which I am not, could you explain what a stirrup is? <laughs> yes, yeah, stirrup is they're the, basically they're they're they look like D rings, but it's what your feet go into when you're riding a horse. So on the side of the saddle, there's two leather pieces that go down, and the stirrup is a arch looking piece that goes under. It's just like a D ring, and your foot goes into it. So the number two toe is so that you can easily find that, so your toe is not too big to very quickly get into without being able to see it. Okay. And then the packer heel is so that it is not so cumbersome to yeah. get out of it if it was to get caught up on something else. Because keep in mind, like today we see saddles as just something you sit on, but traditionally they were packed with lots of stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, they had side packs, they had packs that went on the top, like they carried a lot of things on them. Right. Uh, but the idea behind it is everything built around it is designed to get in and out of those stirrups without being able to see them. Okay. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, that's so cool. I mean, that's literally how people used to travel back then. We didn't have cars with trunks. You know, they had to load everything onto their horse and caravan. So that's so cool. Uh, I love reliving history like that. <laughs> it's it, it's a, a different concept, too, because like, you know, as I said, every one of these heels yeah. has a work function in mind. Like here, mm-hmm. here's another pair. These are my olive palisade bison, shrunken bison. You know, this is this is also a a dogger heel, but this one is actually done with a packer breast, as you can see. It's an in cut uh, packer breast. Interesting. Okay. So now wow. it is curved and it should be straight, but yeah. yeah. So and it's it's one of those things that you know, it, there, there's marketing jargon. Like, like the yeah. one thing that has existed in shoes for over 150 years, it's marketing nonsense. Like the, oh. that will never go away. It's yeah. always been ingrained into it. There's always been, I, I mean, you know, the most famous one that everyone's going to remember is the, you know, the action arch support in the PF flyers from the Sandlot. You know, that, that that's the thing that's always going to exist, right? That's true. That is so true. Yeah. A lot of it is, you're right. It's marketing, but then there's another element of you know, there's so there, it's another thing where I'm starting to understand all of this as being a continuum, right? Like recently, I started talking about the difference between a factory field boot and a handmade field boot. You know, there's a continuum between both, and I think Grant Stone's like a really good example of like right dead in the middle. Like they're using handmade boutique materials, but they're building it in kind of a factory production. That's why they kind of have a little bit of a factory feel. Not not so much like, you know, like a Willie's boot, you know, which yep. feels to me 100% handmade, you know, whereas yep. a Thursday, a Thursday is definitely 100% factory feel, 100% all the way through, you know. Yeah, the, the quickest way to tell if it's a factory feel boot, there yep. wasn't a lot of care put into choosing the leather panels. That's uh-huh. always the first dead giveaway. Even yeah. like guys like Frank's who build their boots very factory style where everyone does a position in a job, it's still handmade. Yeah. The biggest thing with them is your boots will be made out of a single side of leather. They do okay. not mix. Some of it's because Seidel can't be consistent, yeah. but the re- uh, other parts of it are as they pick the most desirable pieces of the hide and right. every pair of commanders gets made out of a single hide. And it's it's sim- and a lot of people do this. It's not uncommon. And and it's just for leather. I mean, working with leather, you've probably seen it now. The consistency among leather is not even. And on that note, when it comes to heels, 
do I have a good example here? Not on that one. So the the most of these guys in the U.S. all get their leather stacks in the same place. Okay. And recently, the consistency and thickness has become beyond abysmal. Like it's bad. Oh, really? And I think my best example I might be wearing. Okay. I am. Oh, <laughs> so my Frank's monkey boots and battle assy car. Let me do some extortionist shit here. Yeah. Hell Hopefully yeah. that could be seen. Yeah. But look, my midsole. Look how thin the midsole is on that, especially around the heel area. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then the heel stack, if you zoom in on it for the people in YouTube land, you'll yeah. see that the heels thicknesses in those are not uh -huh. consistent at all. Okay. So right. all the guys right. get these pre-made. They don't generally make them in-house unless they have a special reason to. Yeah. So because of that, yeah. what you tend to find in a lot of cases is that heel thickness, one, isn't consistent. And number two, they have built it to a height on a ruler. Not a number of heel lifts, not a number of heel stacks. It's yeah. a height on a ruler. It is five eighths or, yeah. you know, three quarter or whatever heel size heels they buy. They different right. makers buy them at different thicknesses for how they want to level them, for right. how they want to shape them. There's like shaping reasons. So like they they might go two sizes up to get mm -hmm. a nice end cut on something. I'm on a packer that they'll go a whole size down. There's various methodologies behind why they do it and where they have waste and not waste for different reasons and sizes. But the consistency and thickness between them has gotten very abysmal over the last yeah. two years. Oh, definitely. If you, if you look at these, these are the flathead engineers and natural chrome Excel. I don't know if you can see, but the, the leather layers are. Yeah. Not... Yeah. There's, yeah, there's, there's two really thin leather layers at the bottom and the top. Yeah. Yeah, One's this, the heel ram, but you can see in the very middle, there's a, a, a missized piece compared to the rest of it. Yeah, it almost looks like a wood. What do you call those? Shivs or those? Oh, uh, shims. Yeah, shims. Shims, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It almost looks like a shim because I don't know if the camera's capturing it, but yep. it, 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 it has it, at times. There's angles we've been able to see it. Okay, it completely tapers out. Yeah, I'll, I can... Mm -hmm. Put a photo or I, I I I do I do have examples of that as well. We're just in the leveling process. I've had to put one in that starts in the back and is almost non-existent in the front to get it yeah. leveled correctly. But like so they they come pre-built. So those are pieces they add on after the fact to get the leveling done correctly. And that's this one thing in general. They've all been dealing with this. Like I've yeah. got one pair of my golf green franks. If you look really really close at the midsole, it's actually two midsoles glued together. Oh, gotcha. To get the right thickness, yeah. To get to get the the correct ten to twelve iron thickness, it's actually two midsoles glued together. Very cool. And and and, and this is you know this is just what you know makers deal with. Like I, I recently yeah. purchased some JFJ Baker like traditional oak bark tan leather for a couple pairs of Franks I'm going through to try out. You know the the traditional 1940s feel, right? What you would have felt in the 40s when some of the American tanneries that that went out of business in the 70s still did oak bark yeah. tan leather and the, one of the few actual real true 14 month oak bark tan leather makers and I, wow. it got there and they're like holy crap this is 19 ounces so i was like well i know it's meant to be sanded a little bit but it's basically like double midsole in a single piece so we'll see how well that turns out i got enough to do six footbeds six midsoles and six heel stacks so we'll 19 ounces Oh Dude. yeah, yeah, yeah! I'll, here, I'll send you pictures. That's it, it's, body armor. <laughs> it, it, it's funny you say that. I looked it up, and that's actually what nineteen ounce leather was used for. Its only, almost only purpose was armor inserts. Yep, it's the only thing it, it's used for. It, it would otherwise. It is. A, it is definitely. So here's the three on a different day, but here's the original two they sent, and it's just like man. So I got two different thicknesses. I got it was labeled as seven, eight iron, nine, ten iron, but it's more like twelve iron and fourteen iron. <laughs> So. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> well, hey man, this is about to shut off on me and then it's going to make me wait 10 minutes to it before I could call you back. Do you have yep. um, time for another go? Just making sure we don't miss any from Ben's article. So there was the, the block, there was the logger slash woodsman cowboy heel. That's a packer. Yeah, basically a packer, a much more angle dogger heel. The dogger heel is also straight. So the dogger is more like yep. this one. Red dogger slash Cuban. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then the, the Cuban Cuban heels are often conflated with dogger heels. Some people use those names interchangeably, but the Cuban is more like a cowboy heel in that the back and the sides of the heel taper inward from the top to the bottom, while the heel breast is typically straight rather than angled. Okay. Yep. Yes. And then that is that is it on the article on the stitch down article so 
Yeah, so we covered all of our bases there. Next, we were going to talk about lasts, right? Different. Yeah. Last, we get into a little bit of a difficult one because I sent you a bunch of pictures to go along with the last stuff. Last, we're going to, you know, talks a lot about like toe spring. It gets yeah. deep into, so there's what's called heel lift and toe spring mm-hmm. and then arch support. Now, how deep you want to get into this? I don't know if you have your phone around, but I sent you a whole bunch of pictures for this. Yeah, and see. we could start by talking about a last and, and kind of, you know, like what makes the last and how it works. And then we can kind of go into the pictures. So there's a golden ratio of where your ball is supposed to go versus your feet line. But the biggest thing in starting with the last is once you get past like volume and length, obviously it's toe spring versus heel height versus arch support. Cause that's really what defines a last, right? Okay. Besides toe shape, kind of what it's going to be. So, you know, let's, let's go on to lasts here. So yeah, let's do that. Lasts okay. realistically have five main components, right? Yeah. They're going to have obviously length and width. So ignoring that, because that's just standard sizing. You're going to have toe shape. You're going to have toe spring. You're going to have heel spring, heel lift. And then lastly, you're going to have your, they call it your, your, your heel shape. What they mean okay. by heel shape, that's getting into the Alden combination heel stuff. That is a rigid conforming heel versus a floating heel. Okay. Interesting. Is it this kind of what you're talking about here? Kind of. So in, okay. in like a pair of Knicks or whites, when you wear them, your heel does not make contact with any of the sidewalls. It's called a floating heel. Okay. Whereas with a pair of Aldens, because they use that combination heel with a B width, you know, yeah. it's like the D slash B or whatever. That is so that everything around it touches your heel while you're wearing it. So the heels are, you'd want to show it from the heel counter cover. So like this way. Yeah. So you can see right there very clearly how the heel shapes are very different in the two of those. Yeah. And th- that's just, a, it's a wear specific. So if you're wearing a floating heel, you can have the backstay be very straight so mm. that internally it has very little dip. But if it's a conforming heel, like a combination heel, like an Alden, there's a very distinct heavy S shape on the inside on what you feel on your foot. Okay. To where it, it seats back in deeper because it's making contact. So floating heel doesn't need all that extra space. And generally a floating heel is more associated with a taller boot, something that is 8, 10, 12 inches realistically versus like a shorter boot but it, it's it's a preference thing at the end of the day a last is a last the 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 boot starts and stops with the last everything about the shape its aesthetics the way it works specific away from sewing and broguing and pinking and these different things that are stylistic choices yeah the last itself is what makes the boot the boot the boot only looks like what it looks like because of the last okay interesting so I'm sort of trying to conceptualize it like the last is like the DNA. And so everything that comes from that, from everything that springs forth from that seed, (laughs) that progenitor, which the last is, will be dictated by the last itself. So it makes a lot of sense as to why we get into these different shapes of the heels and the soles themselves and just the different looks and materials that have to be incorporated and and the different patterns that need to be incorporated. That's, that's so interesting. That's, that's a whole new way to think about making boots. Cause you know, like me, I'm just thinking, making, I I use this analogy all the time. Making boots is like making sandwiches. You get the same basic ingredients and you put them together and you know, (laughs) but correct. If you're using the same last, that's a hundred percent the case. And for most brands, they have a last, right? For example, a good example is like that Renov last, the A11 last there. That is just a slightly altered A1 for a slip on boot and to have a bigger toe. That's really all that he's done to that last. I actually really prefer his A7 last, which is this last right here. This is my red, brown, shinky horse, but it's a very wide last. Oh, with a nice wow. narrow t- with it. With, well, I just wouldn't say narrow toe, but it has a nice shapely toe for this Norwegian split toe. But as you can yeah. see, it's a big, wide last overall, oh, and it's it's also a very voluptuous last too on top of it. 
Yeah, um, nice. And, and and this one is probably a little shorter on the heel to toe spring. You can feel okay. more of the arch support than you can on the eleven. Now on, he's making me a pair in. Uh, it was supposed to be natural show Corvin, but it's going to be bourbon show Corvin because he couldn't get the natural, and the natural that he could get was really dark compared to the bourbon. Um, yeah. it's going to be a pair of monkey boots in the same last, but it, uh, he's actually going to do a slightly taller heel. Okay. So, <laughs> but but in this, as you can see right here. This last is designed to have a specific toe spring, which is this piece right here, uh -huh. a specific heel spring, which is this piece right here. And so mm -hmm. that when it sits, it's balanced, right? Okay. Which is weird why sometimes they let you do stuff like raise the heel because now your toe springs off or lower yeah. the heel because now your toe spring and your heel springs off. So it's weird that companies let you do that because a last has one defined toe spring and one yeah. defined heel spring. So it's meant for a specific heel lift height and heel right. angle it, it's not really meant to be adjusted from there just like if you were to go order a pair of franks like i want a number two toe yeah you're not going to get a 55 last you're going to get a 53 32 last because that's got the number two toe if you want the number four toe you're not going to get the 55 last you're going to get the 1977 last oh really Why so the different that? lasts have different toes they're not combination or interchangeable okay like they're they're a key part of it say we take like nicks for example this the same exact stuff applies their lasts are different. Their Packer last is different from their 55 and H&W. Just like, mm -hmm. and in their case, their 11067 is actually meant to have a shorter heel than the 55. So okay. it, it's, it's, it's a last that's kind of stretched upwards a little bit for more volume, has more toe spring and a shorter heel. Okay. Now, they let you order it both ways. It's not really meant to go both ways. There's there's some give and take with everything. If you look at one of the pictures I sent you on, like the cowboy boots, cowboy boots, this is completely customizable. Well, cowboy boots use something called a wedge. So when you have the boot, and I'm just going to use this Frank Spriker here, this beautiful Kansas boot in Badalassi Carlo Pueblo Estencia, otherwise known as turquoise. This is the, the correct balance of this boot. But say I wanted this heel height this way, right? So you'd have to artificially add some toe spring and the arch would be completely off. Well, what they do is in the cowboy boot, when you do the taller heel, they balance out by putting a wedge right here in the in the rand under the footbed that will balance it back the correct way to get the arch in the right spot to accommodate the taller heel. And then they do processes in the sole to get the toe spring where it needs to be, which a lot of times tends to be just artificially extending the toe a little bit to add the spring in. You know, the old term with cowboy boots, cockroach killers, right? That That's the concept. Interesting. And Man. then that machine you see that last on is how they balance that. That's Hallie. that's them balancing that last to get what they're looking for. Fascinating. <laughs> it's so much more of an art than a science, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yes. And well, well, and that goes back to a comment I made earlier of how we're seeing a lot more females in boot making. Well, that that leads to that as well, too, because it very much is. I, yeah. I mean, there there is no magic to sizing. Frank right. said this in your last boot talk it, it is they are taking what you have given them, adding a fudge factor in. And in yeah. the case of like high arch boots, for example, and cowboy boots very much fall into this. They're trying to figure out what the boot is going to look like after a thousand hours of wear on your foot, not oh. the second you put it on. Because those are two different things. You're, you're, you're comparing Mercury to Jupiter in this case in terms of distance. They're not looking at your first step. They're looking at your, your like what it's going to be when this thing's completely broken in and you're wearing it on a regular basis. Yeah. And that know. is... That yep. is a process that all bespoke makers go through. And, and it's one yeah. that, you know, there's a reason there's a fitting boot in a lot of times for bespoke shoes. And but, like, that makes such perfect sense too. When I went through the sizing process with Arrow, they sent me a fit jacket. I'm like, what's a fit jacket? Nope. They're like, we're not making you a jacket until you do our fit jacket first. <laughs> like, yeah. And then it makes sense. I don't get why more makers maybe don't offer that service. Like, just build a boot, build a run of boots, like cheaper boots in various sizes and say, hey, you're a first time customer. We're sending you a fit boot, you know, and just go from there. You know, if I I, I could see why why certain businesses wouldn't be able to always do that. But I think if you're trying to build up clients as compared to customers, like you said, in reference to creosote, building up clients, I would definitely want to do the fit boot first personally that's what i would if i started making boots that's what i would do i'd say oh you want you want me to you know spend <laughs> 25 hours making you boots well 
here, I'm going to send you a, uh, <laughs> a try on pair first before we both commit to that sort of investment. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, and, and a lot of people do. Gabbard, in his case, I think is confident enough in his skills to do it. But okay. there's a lot of bespoke things you can do to make adjustments on an ill-fitting boot. Okay. The, the other thing is, for in his experience, since he comes from the cowboy boot world, yeah. they can tell a lot of times just from your measurements if you've made something like, this doesn't seem right. I need to ask you about it. And if you don't have a good answer, like, ah, let's try this again. Like, maybe yeah. you've missed something here. Like, get me a side profile view. A lot of times in cowboy boots, they do like an ink plotting of your foot for pressure points and stuff as well, just to double check kind of how you walk and how to shape your heel. And and that's very important for that wedge piece I was talking about. That because realistically, you're you, if we think of the last holistically, right? So we we take a, a a very holistic last. You know, you have your toe spring, you have your heel spring and heel height, right? Yes, that's what determines your arch support. Arch support is determined by those two. This is very much a temperature equals volume times pressure deal. Like okay. you determine pressure of the volume, your atmospheric pressure, and your temperature. As temperature goes up, pressure goes up. As temperature goes down, pressure goes down. This is the same thing. If I lower the heel height, the toe spring has to come down, or I have to add more arch support. If I make the toe spring smaller, I have to lower the heel to bring it back, which is going to affect the arch support. In the end, we are not building this boot based on this arch. We're building it based on these, on the toe spring and the heel to get the arch we want, which is the volume and temperature, essentially. It, it's the same process. And so any adjustments we make on all of this are, are really going to be the same thing. And there's there's tricks to it, like obviously. Because like right here, you know, this is a floating heel. This is a pretty straight up and down heel. There's not a lot of curve to this for your foot to sit in because this is an external counter cover. The inside is actually the same thickness as this backstay piece right here. Like your heel doesn't go to the back of this. There's a big old thick counter in here, and this is an external cover. Whereas if you take, uh, I don't have a pair right here, but the pair you were holding up right there. Um, Imperiums. Uh, the yeah, Imperiums. Oh, I do have a pair of Imperiums right here. Actually, hold on one second. Right over here. This is an internal counter cover. Even though it's sewn on the outside, the counter cover itself is actually on the inside of the boot. Because th that's what the stitching on the outside is. This is very like Alden style. So the reason the back stays a single outside piece. So this one has a lot more definition curve to it because it's not as floating of a heel. Be in the counter cover is internal. So your heel you know, goes only to like the right here mark on the inside, which gives you a little bit more curve than a floating heel. Now this is in there in his Rudy last which is a very like kind of Western Pacific Northwesty last. So it's not the best example, but the other ones like the Maestro last, which I think is the one you have there. It's going to show that just a little bit more. You said the Meister last. I think, I think he normally does the Grizzly and the Maestro last because that's a Grizzly as well, but it's yeah. done in the Rudy last, which is a, a bigger higher arch, higher heel kind of last. Okay. I see more toe spring. Yep. Very cool. So Yeah. yeah love these things they fit super good they're they're also they're super short and super wide these were mm -hmm. sent by by mario these are his hand-me-downs and uh, yeah they fit really really good though very similar to my what i'm wearing now my custom craft man i i'm so thankful that ben opened up a second entry for the stitch down thunder yeah. downs. like i've been meaning to wear my trumans and horse rump like way more but like i keep reaching for these custom craft like they're just so damn comfortable they they look so awkward because they're so they're so short and fat like yeah they're the widest boot i've ever seen like it's it's one of the most comically wide boots i've ever seen in person and yet for some reason i just i love it like i'm standing in them now and I'm just like I don't yeah, want to pick I, them up. <laughs> and, and that's that's a good point. Like when it comes to a lot of the weird fitting things, a lot of people tend to go over tight on stuff. Yeah, uh, kind of a, a little bit more of a, of a sloppy wide fit. I think more people are going to find comfortable than a extremely tight snug fit. Right, right, definitely, definitely. Yeah, especially if you have really veiny feet like I do. Oh yeah, definitely for sure. Well, that's really cool. Was there anything else about lasts that we wanted to cover? Because yeah, this this could be its own like three hour talk right here. Yeah, I, I mean, to kind of keep it like it rounded into the heel conversation. So when we talk about heels, the last is what really allows this to be possible, right? Um, yeah. Not keep showing the same pair. Let me grab another pair. Because here, here's another really interesting one, right? Because this, so this is uh, my Brian the Bootmaker Underdog Roll Clubs. Okay. This is a last that's actually not meant to go with this Cuban heel. It, it, it turned into more of a, a dress bevel heel. It's supposed to be Cuban, but because of me wanting this natural heel lift, he had to not to not expose the washers. It had to go a little bit more woodsman and a little less Cuban. 
this is this is not traditionally a last that would do this heel. So to accommodate that, what he's had to do is add, as you can see by sitting on my hand, quite a bit more toe spring to yeah. make it work. And he's had to to accommodate with a slightly different toe shape. Okay. To make it go. So essentially, he kind of uh, built this a little bit more off something that's a little closer to his engineer last, where he's made some adjustments to make it work. Yeah. So normal because normally people with this main underdog last, which I think is the RC nineteen forty, if I remember correctly, uses the low woodsman heel, which is akin to his version of the block heel or kind of a Cuban heel, a really short Cuban heel. But this is his actual Cuban Cuban, which is the correct Cuban, which is the two inch heel. Which okay. Is heel. As you can see. It's it's balanced and it's definitely takes a sharper turn right here in the arch area than it would traditionally. But these are adjustments yep. that have been made to accommodate the taller heel. And okay. as you can see, you know this is another kind of a little bit more floaty heel, but it's also got a lot of back curve to it for kind of a floatier heel. Yeah, now, he's got sure. a big external counter cover as well uh -huh. um, that that accommodates a lot of that same work. Okay. Um, Very cool. Ones. These are my Willie's. He doesn't call these loggers. I forget what he calls these. Pioneer, if I remember right. Okay. Maybe it's Pioneer. Pioneer. Man, you are a human dictionary. <laughs> yeah, I, Pioneer might also be his monkey boots. I can't remember. I do have some of his monkey boots that I was hope, planning to go reach for here in a second. But yeah, so the heel on this is pretty much a logger, right? Yeah, it's getting into that dress logger heel, yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, the, the breast on it is... It's a flatter one, but it's still got some curve to it. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, like you're saying, it's it's floating. Okay. That's so that's such an interesting term, floating heel. Well, it just really refers to the idea that your heel is not completely enveloped in a cup. Right. And it also eliminates the, the need that, like, you know, Alden has to have two different heel sizes depending on your width to accommodate widths. Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of getting away from the old combination last mentality. Okay. Because because uh. realistically, you know, if we if we get back to before Alden became like a heavy ready to wear boot brand, they would attack the leather on when you went and got your stuff measured to make the heel bigger in between the combination heel size, which is why they only have two. Otherwise, you would have a heel that's correctly sized for each last iteration, not, you know, using the B width heel for the the C, D, E, and then double E, triple E uses the D heel. It, yeah. It makes no sense. You would move them all together. So very clearly that was designed to be able to make adjustments okay. on your heel choice. But as you go more ready to wear, obviously that's not possible, right? Like yeah. you're going to have to make concessions at that point. There is now going to officially be a limit on what you can and cannot do in terms of custom building. And, and that's a volume thing that that's just, you know, a business choice at the end of the day, whether you choose to do something like that or not. Obviously, the more bespoke you go, the longer a pair of boots takes to make, the ultimately the less money you make. Right. Um, it also means you can't batch steps together, which makes your product more expensive. If everyone wonders why a pair of Brian the Bootmaker or Roll Club or even a, a Julian Boots, if we want to go down that path, yeah. get so expensive, it's because they're you know not done really in batches. They're they're done more made to measure in a more controlled scenario. And the best example I've always heard of that was Lisa Sorrell says this is like I I can control my demand one of two ways. Mm -hmm with price or by pissing people off i'm always going to choose price i mean because there's always so many boots you can make in a year as a custom boot maker so either right. you got to open your books to a certain point and stop or yeah. use your price to help control the influx of people wanting to purchase your boots and the reality right. at the end of the day is when you get into those super custom things like there's some choices you got to make here yes. you know as a custom boot maker if you make a boot your customer hates and can't wear you've got to remake it and you don't get paid for that because right. they can't just sell it. Right. So you've got to kind of weigh it. those differences and be good at that, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. Because your business can go under if if you're not careful with that type of thing. If you just say yes to everything and then it's not paying you what you need <laughs> and the workload grows to be too incumbent, then guess what? You know, you just have a psychotic break and you just can't. You just can't. Yeah. These are people that aren't working off just one or two lasts. They've maybe got right. three or four different styles. They've designed the last themselves, or you get into the ballpark where they make a custom last every single time. 
Wow. That's I mean, that, that's that's what we get into boat spoke footwear where they carve a last out for you. And it comes down to maybe you have three lasts for your specific foot in three different styles, but you, you they yeah. fall into those styles, like a very casual style, very formal style, maybe a more like riding or outdoorsy style. I mean, it just really kind of depends on, on what you're looking for. So there there are you know realities to that as well. Um, okay. And that's not even talking like like Dennis from Custom Craft, who's who's getting a specific style made for him. It's, he, he's ordering the last made to measure from the company that makes it with the measurements on it. Okay. But it's still going to be following his base model, right? Like it's still going to yeah. have the same heel height. It's going to have the same heel spring, same toe spring, same arch support. Okay. Um, versus someone who's customizing those. And that's when you get in the cowboy boot world. They use that fancy machine that balances the boot. Yeah, And then they make the adjustments they need to bring the internal balancing of what you feel on your feet back down, which is why some cowboy boot shafts face forward like this, like where they lean forward in this like kind of strange. Yeah, that, is that right there. Talking about? That, okay. that, that's how they get the toe spring to the heel height and everything balanced. And then they use the wedge and the heel to get it all where it needs to be. Fascinating. Oh, man. <laughs> yes, it, it's, it's, it's so a completely badass. different world when it comes to like how – you want to go about doing this stuff i can yep. tell you like from from my standpoint of just a tiny tiny maker myself doing the bags and stuff like we're we're in the process now of making five ox blood bags and uh, you know what it's yeah i could price them cheaper because they're not custom orders but and yeah streamlining it doing five at a time it, it's kind of easy because you just do the same thing five times in a row you repeat it, you repeat it five times in a row. And so in, in other words, I'm able to buy, build five of those in the time it would probably take me to build, I don't know, two custom two. tanks. Yeah. So so th that's really efficient, but it's a risk on my part because I don't know if they'll sell at all. Like I just, I have no clue if they're even going to sell. I'm just making them and just wishing for the best. You know, I can't predict what's going to happen after that. Yeah. So, no, I mean, that that's what ready to wear footwear is. Yeah, I, I mean, the risk. as you've met different makers that do ready to wear stuff, like until their brands get big, these guys aren't rolling in money if they're no. even profitable at all. Not and at just all. just think of the flip side of that. If they were a custom boot maker where you've got to do all the patterning, you've got to do the prototyping, you've got to get someone crazy enough to actually want to wear the stuff you wear to yes. actually get some practice in. And yes. if you listen to people talk about that, I think Dennis mentioned that Flora Knight is making me a pair of custom cowboy boots that'll be done November 2nd. It's the same thing for her. You know, at a certain point, you can make shoes for friends for free, but you've got to start the business. And she moved from New Zealand to America to be a boot maker. Wow. Because so cool. the amount of people in New Zealand that are willing to pay for that versus, you know, the amount of people who want custom cowboy boots in Oklahoma, you let right. me know which one's probably going to work out better for you. <laughs> I, I mean, that, that's just how this goes. And, right. and, and, you know, at a certain point, you got to start, you know, making stuff now, like Flora's price is like half of what someone like Lee Miller or Lisa Sora will charge you, maybe right. even close to a third, um, yeah. depending on your makeup and like what choices you make. Right. But yeah. I mean, these are, this is, this is kind of how it goes. I, I mean, yeah. it, it's interesting because the olden days you lived in a place and you just found jobs. Right. Nowadays we tend to move to where jobs are. Which so is true. a big, which is a big swing for that kind of work as well. Definitely, definitely, and you know, it's it's interesting too because watching, you know, Vincent Truman, it was really stressing him out to have to do the MTO constantly, and they're happy to do it still. But like, I could see why he wants to focus more on the ready-made boot model because it's mm -hmm. like, all right, guys, this week it's all double shot. We're we're making all this, you know. We're doing a full run of the British tan double shot, every size. So everybody knows what to do. They get to work. They punch out an entire batch stock of, you know, however many hundred, 200 <laughs> pair oh. ready made to ship double. Yeah, shot. No one has to think there's no double checking, which one's supposed to be. Oh crap. I sewed the wrong color of stitching in so on and so forth. Now I've got to go through the stress of putting the second row in and then taking the old row out and trying not to miss any holes. Yeah. So so forth. Yeah. No, I, it's, it's a thing. I mean, you, even the Pacific Northwest guys, you, you tend to see the reality is they more often than not, will have only a couple guys doing the custom stuff while everybody else is doing the, just like the, I'm going to call it production work, but like yeah. the quick ship pairs, the standard build outs, however you want to say it from that point. Yeah. 
that makes sense. And I get, I get it now. I get it from both sides. And, and, you know, there's always this sort of consumer, what's the word, not narcissism, but consumer pessimism or neuroticism, or in other words, they always think that the maker is like getting rich and that they're getting ripped off, you know, misconception really. Yeah. It's like, no, the more I study this subject, the more I, the deeper I get into boots, the more I realize nobody's getting rich doing this that they are, they do it because they want to do it that's the only reason they're doing it because they are not making these guys don't have yachts they don't have three mansions you know they, they do it because that's what they want to do and talking to Wyatt Gilmore he says he tells me the same thing you know <laughs> they're not rolling in dough they just genuinely love doing this and it, it's a it's a tough business you know it's it's probably just as tough as as doing restaurants you know what I mean like it's I think of... you probably have a, a better chance of making restaurants work, to be entirely honest. <laughs> I, I mean, because here's the thing. Go ask the makers how many boots they make a year. They'll probably tell you. And then you can go to their website, do the math and figure out how much they would make if it was 100% profit. And then right. be shocked when like, you know, 30, 40% of that is more than likely not going to be materials. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> materials. Yeah time like well I'm, I'm just i'm ignoring time all i'm just talking like actual money you have to spend to do it right exactly yeah. Yeah. and that doesn't count the years you bought tools i'm just saying like yeah. like for example gabard says on his website how many boots he can make in a year everyone can do the math on how much he's going to make yeah. take 30 percent of that away in materials cost and you basically know what the guy makes each year exactly fully transparent there's no there's no guesswork, you know, there's no shady business behind the scenes. Yeah. These guys are not, they're not getting rich. They're just, they're just happy to do it. And that's why, you know, I'm happy to support them and, and keep the, keep the love of boots, boots thriving. Well, real quick, cause we only have eight, eight minutes, minutes yeah. before this. I see the down. timer and I didn't see it before. I see it now. I was yeah. mid sentence last time when it, ki- when it kicked off. I see it now. Exactly. Yeah. Zoom is not being, is not being good to us right now. But uh, I'm working on a video right now talking about consumer neuroticism when it comes to buying expensive items. And so just real quick, like, because this could be its own five hour discussion, but the, the the premise that I wanted of this subject is I noticed it early on when I started looking at expensive denim, like the blog posts, the, the endless novel, long blog blog posts online about all these different $300 or $700 jeans and different guys experiences and all the arguments back and forth. And the same translates into boots. My theory is that the reason why this gets so heated and so neurotic is because this stuff costs a lot and people have purchase remorse or what's, what's the better term? Buyer's uh, remorse. Yeah. Buyer's remorse. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that that's something that I wanted to delve into deeper you know, at another time, but real like just off the top of your head, what are your thoughts on that? How does that translate into the boot world as far as from like your perspective? Like, well, I, I think people treat it the same way they treat power tools. They think it's a linear gain back. Like if it costs three times the price, I should get three times more out of it. And the answer is no, nothing right. in this world is linear. What you are buying is something that is more specialized and mm-hmm. the more specialized it is, the easier it is to use. Doesn't mean that it does more. It just lets you do what it is meant to do Mm -hmm. better, more efficiently, and in a lot of times, more comfortably and easier. That's really it when it comes down. Because why would you get a made-to-measure boot? Quite simply, less break-in. That's really the answer. I mean, maybe maybe there's customizations you want that other people won't do. That's probably part of it. But generally speaking, you buy made-to-measure boots because they're less break-in and they're meant for your feet. Yes. That's That's really well said. And, you know, I get that question from the normies all the time. It's like, well, I've had, you know, these Nike sneakers for 25 years. And I'm like, well, first off, A, that's disgusting. B, yeah. like, yeah, it's true. I had Clarks for 10 years that were bond welted, glued together, and they cost me $90 and they didn't fall apart either. So it's like, it's true. Like, does this stuff last longer? Well, not necessarily. Like, well, it sh- it, it will. It last. will, depending on how you use it, right? Like if, if yeah. you can beat up a pair of franks whites or nicks logger boots in three years yeah obviously anything construction or any anything cemented construction is not going to work for you that'll last weeks at best but if a pair of like i don't know we'll say nicks roberts last you i don't know seven years before you need a resole yes obviously a 
you know, cement constructed boot would be perfectly fine for you. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, to, to convince the normies, in other words, like that it's worth it to spend $500 on a good pair of boots. It's like, it's an uphill battle because if, if they're not, uh, if they don't see this and they're just automatically like entranced by it, like enticed by it, by just seeing this, because for me, that's what it is. I look at it and I know it. I, I know quality when I see it, uh, my, my brain identifies it. You know, it's not a matter of yeah. not looking at this stuff just in terms of like, oh, these are, you know, I need, I need shoes. So where am I going to get shoes? You know, I go to pay less shoes, get some shoes. No, like I, I want something that is sort of, iconic and sort of resonates with me on a on a deep conscious on a deep level of my consciousness and that's what i see when i look at this you know this is something that goes back for me it's you know. artistic is what it is at the end of the day it's aesthetically yeah. artistic and and realistically if we're being honest uh for the people who have never put their foot in it it's hard to put into words like what a <laughs> properly made properly sized boot feels like versus whatever you've been wearing like yeah. th there's no way for me to explain that to you that is a very tactile feel yes like some people like knurling some people yeah. like striations some mm -hmm. people don't like either but there's you're not gonna be able to look at that and tell those things they, that that's just right. not how that works that's, that's a, one thing is the tactile feel of the boot on your foot walking in it. The other thing is some people do not like break in. And I get yeah. that. I, a lot of people advocate for this. I'll be one of the very few that tells you there's no such thing as a work caboot and a casual boot. They're two okay. separate things. They should be made with two separate leathers. They should be made, made with two separate outsoles. Yeah. They're not mixed. Boots have a purpose. Each boot is ordered with a purpose in mind. Right now, what that purpose is doesn't have to be different. One could be for meant for wearing in the rain, and one could be meant for you know wearing on a dry day. If you have natural Chrome XL, yeah. strong chance you don't want to see the water spots from the rain that it's going to get. Oh yeah. If you don't want the water spots, that is not your rain day boot. It's right. Just a, it's just simply that. Like it's I think even. Real. I think even this pair of uh, Brian, the boot makers here, the, my underdogs here, have rain spots on them. Oh, do they? I think. I think so. Can't see them right now in this light, but I'm pretty sure this boot right here does. But like, you can see like the indentation on the toe right there. That's from a server door. Me oh, lifting okay. up a server door with my toe. Nice. And then this one right here, I've got a nice deep gouge from the dog in the toe. <laughs> That's almost all the way through the toe cap. But, you know, like I said, are they, I, it's, I, I, I was on the list for over three years for these. So these are like $1,500 boots. Are they expensive? Yeah. Am I going to treat them like they should be, you know, not worn? Absolutely not. Like that's not the point of a pair of boots. Now I'm not going to intentionally take them out there and drag them behind my truck to win the patina the Thunderdome that I'm not going to do, <laughs> but you know, here we are. Right. I, I, that's, that's the reality. Well, uh, that's and it, it's, it's, it's different for everybody on that. And, and I get it. Like, you know, someone's like, oh man, I could never wear them outside if I bought $500 boots. Well, right. you might take them outside and you might find you like them. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm also not here to convince you of, you know, anybody of how to spend their money. I can just tell you, if you give it a shot and you try it, you give it a little college try, you might find you like it. You or maybe exactly. you don't and it's not for you. Maybe Thursdays yeah. are perfect for you. And my answer to that is find someone who sells Rambler leather. Yes. What sneaker yeah. leather? Rambler's yeah. the way to go. You right. will not have any problems whatsoever with breaking on Rambler. The only thing you'll be fighting is the footbed. Yep. And the only thing I can tell you from there is don't do double midsoles and ask them if you can if they have thinner options. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. That is well said. Oh man. That thank you for that insight. Because I, I knew if anybody would have a good response to the, that. When it comes to heels, the real yeah. reality is the different shapes are functional. But mm -hmm. we don't choose them for their functional pieces anymore. We choose them for their aesthetic look. Yeah. And the differences in their aesthetics come down to weight savings. They are shaved in the ways they're shaved for one function. Like I said, logger heel is really meant for the angle of the heel spring, how you get to the heel spring, and to work with loggers gaffers. Yeah. You know, the curves in are for loggers gaffers. The packer, the reason it's such a deep cut in the packer is mm. for a spur shelf. Right. That way it doesn't mess with your spurs. It also gets in and out of the whole, of the stirrups easier. Yeah, the stirrup. Um, yeah, there, there are different size, there's different styles of stirrup too that all play into that as well. Um, so ignoring the the very customizable saddle world. Um, and then when it comes to a dogger heel, it's originally a walking heel. Like the packer was for riding, the dogger was for walking, the dogger was trying to marry two different heel types together to you know make them more accessible. Right. A block heel is 
round three. Let's go. <laughs> I, I just want to iterate this for the audience. I hope they really appreciate this because this is the third round. Zoom only lets me do 40 minute in, um, meetings increments. And then it makes me wait 10 minutes before we send a new link. So, you know, this is for every minute you're watching, 10 went into it. Please appreciate that video by giving us a <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> All right. So anyways, yes, we were talking about consumer neuroticism, right? And like kind of how there's so many directions you can go because unlike in our grandpa's day, you know, grandpa, he would have gone like we were saying earlier, to a local Sears or to the mall or to just whatever local shop was local to him at the time. And the half, maybe half educated salesman would have been, you know, probably more interested in making that sale. Let's or or just, just had a catalog that's like, this is the Sears catalog of how to order this. Like here, here's your documentation of how to sell to Farmer John his next new pair of work boots, right. you know, something around those lines. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and, you know, maybe they would have had like cool services that didn't necessarily exist back then. You know, I, I gave the example of there's probably a chance that you could have taken measurements at the store and got a made to measure pair that Sears, you know, whoever they ordered through or farmed to the workout to at the time could right. do adjustments like that. Or, you know, maybe they had a local cobbler after it happened, the cobbler took care of making whatever adjustments needed to be made for the customer. And maybe they just farmed that workout that way. Or maybe they had, who knows, maybe they had a cobbler in house. You know, if you look at it, yeah. men's warehouse still has has tailors in the house, at least do basic alterations. Yeah, they have tailors on site. Yeah, and that's how it used to be. And like you were saying earlier, there used to be a cobbler on every corner. And now yep. there's a cobbler every, you know, 50 square miles. If even that. In some if areas, that. you might there might be a cobbler within a state. Yeah. I don't know where you're at exactly. But the good news is, you know, everyone does mail-in services these days. 25 years ago, I don't know if people would have done that. Maybe that, a couple guys would have would have been okay with doing it for people yeah. to send their stuff in, but I don't think many cobblers would have accepted mail orders 25 years ago. I, I could see it, yeah. And actually, I'd like to correct you. There are zero cobblers in North and South Dakota combined. Zero. <laughs> Boy, there's one in Minnesota. That's a touching state. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have no evidence to support my yeah. comment, by the way. I'm just, I'm yeah. pretty sure there are zero in those two states. And there's a good possibility. I mean, yeah. now, hey, maybe there's an emerging market. Maybe there's a, a way you yeah. can go uh, get boots made in that area. If you're if you're a, a person aspiring to make boots and looking to start a boot factory, maybe those are the states for you. Go, go to North Dakota. Yeah. You have zero competition. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, you know, the lower cost of living, easier way to keep your prices low, so on and so forth. I mean, because we mentioned bespoke bootmakers. That's a reality is you'll find a lot of your bespoke bootmakers are not in big, like like your custom shoemakers tend to be in big places like New York just for the convenience of fitting. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times they are not necessarily in the most expensive areas, and that's to help maintain profit margins. I mean, right. being honest, like, it like makes, it's a, it's a yeah. way to augment paying the bills without having to increase your prices. Right. Um, no. You only do so many boots in a month. Rent always goes up. Utilities always go up. You can't raise your, you know, boot prices every six months. I mean, if you're old and you can raise your boot prices every six months and someone will still buy it. But for a lot of people, that is not the case. What's what's the basic cost for a pair of Aldens now? Like eight hundred dollars or no, uh, it's, it's seven hundred. It, it, I saw it, it recently. Yeah. It, it just crossed the original Shell Cordovan threshold. When I started buying Alden, Shell Cordovan was seven hundred. Now the basic Alden Indie, I think, is seven hundred dollars, like in calfskin. 700 bucks ridiculous like come yeah, on that's that's come really on. getting up there you know I, I, and there's stuff they do in there for a specific reason but a lot of them aren't consumer good reasons and that that's a good thing that's a good point about consumer neuroticism like yeah. there are things that people should be critical of uh that are yeah. not done in their best interest right right I agree. But there are plenty of things they do in your best interest that maybe you don't understand just yeah. aren't informed of or will only make sense after you've wore it for a thousand hours. That's True. that's a, a, a key point. But yeah, expectations, right? Like you just spent I, I think he's up to eighteen seventy five, eighteen hundred seventy five dollars on a creosote nail shank two. Wow. While your life is better, yeah. It did not physically change your outlook of life. Like maybe you were a happier person and your feet are happier and you love them and you're having a great time. Yeah. But we all cannot fall into the trap that like that is definitely going to be so much better than a pair of Vibrix. 
Right. Is it going to be better? Yes. Can you yes. dollar for dollar find the difference? No. no. If you care about the art and soul of boot making and the specific pieces of craftsmanship and the QA, like Gabard's QA is a million times higher than Viper. It's not even yeah. close. They're in different universes. I agree. That's what you're getting money wise out of that. Yeah. Like you're getting a pair of boots from a guy that if that's like talk to the happiness carpenter when that stuff yeah. didn't fit, they made him a new pair. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. Like he tried really? the bespoke stuff. It wasn't working. Made him a new pair. Right. Maybe it was a bad piece of leather. There's, you know, there's a couple things that can go into that, but th that's what you're getting. The difference is. And, and totally. on that note, you know, maybe for a lot of people that are still not, 100% convinced of their size, maybe sticking to ready to wear brands that offer free exchanges is your best bet. Yeah. I mean, I've sent people to Grant Stone to kind of get an idea of where they fit size wise. Yes. Because you can send, I mean, they'll give you one free return, but mm -hmm. if you contact their customer support, they'll get, they'll like, you, you can only do the automated label once, but they'll keep getting you labels. Like, like they'll continue to do it. Right. You know, maybe, right. maybe at four or five, they might ask you to mail it in yourself, but they will get you an additional one if you're on like two or three or something like that definitely yeah they're good people and they're really trying their best to get you sized right and that's what i love about them and yeah you're right with with grant stone there's no risk and sometimes we take for granted what a what a what a luxury that is to have no risk in buying a yeah. boot of that caliber that's that's huge as far as i'm concerned because you know investing like you said 1800 dollars in a pair of creosotes that you don't know if they're gonna fit or not like that's that's a risk by Gabbard and by the consumer equally because Gabbard is putting so much time into it. So, and the consumer is putting so much money into it. They want to make it go right. And there, there needs to be a little bit of buffer extra cash on, on that price point to buffer room for error because it's going to happen. Speaking to my insoles, that's one of my best sellers right now. I have customers, they'll just order a size thinking it's going to fit. And then I'd say probably a third of my insoles get exchanged I don't know what to do about it. I'm going to build out a, a size chart. Most customers reach out with a question like, hey, I wear a nine and a half Grant Stone. What should I wear in your insoles? And then I could tell them, okay, well, a 45 would fit your nine and a half Grant Stones because they do run small. So the customers that do reach out in, in advance, I've never had a return. But customers that just cold order usually all those get returned. <laughs> That's what happens when you're dealing in volume, as opposed to I could take the time to talk and have a 20, 30 minute conversation with each customer. But guess what? Those insoles are going to have to go up in price to like $75 just because yeah, I can't exactly. explain that. You know, I'm learning the hard way how difficult business is. And it makes me appreciate these small batch makers even more because. Yeah, you're not a giant corporation that can just eat massive losses due to extreme volume. I mean, it, right. it simply comes down to that. Like, why yeah. is there no ma and pa? Because running a business is hard. You have to make 30 to 40% profit because guess what? You got to pay taxes. You have right. overhead. This stuff isn't free. It's yes. not all about like, oh, you should only make 10%. You're good with that, right? Well, I mean, cool right. if 10% covered it. Like, well, it's like I got to adjust my prices so 10% profit does cover it. So it's going to get more expensive. Yep, exactly. And conversely, if you want to pay cheaper prices, you're going to get a cheaper product as well, because it's just the way, of, it's just the law of the universe. There's no cheating it. You know, if all I had were customers that wanted to lowball me on every single transaction, I'm going to have no choice but to buy cheaper materials, <laughs> cheaper hardware, cheaper leather, put less time into each item, just turn it, crank it out real quick. It's you know, going to become an Amazon purchase real fast. In yes, hurry. exactly. And that's what it comes down to. It's going to lose that handmade feel it, real quick. So if you don't want handmade, don't buy, don't expect to pay handmade prices. H handmade comes with the price. If you want something that a human paid attention to, it, it costs more. Because once again, a, a human's time in the USA is very different than a human's time in Indonesia or a human's time in China or Vietnam or hell, even the United Kingdom. Like when we start going to the other spectrum, you're going to hit countries that the price per labor hour is more expensive than the USA, especially if it's like Midwest USA versus like, I'm an insole maker in New York City. It's like, oh boy, are you line them bad boys with gold or what? Exactly. And as to your point earlier with the, the Alden shops being located in New, in New York, there's probably at least, ten, I don't know. I visited four myself, different Alden shops. This was back in 2015. I think there's probably a lot more than that shops that sell Alden in New York City. 
but like you're saying there's a reason why they're manufactured in massachusetts i'm right about that right yeah i'm pretty sure yeah but yeah there's a reason they're not manufactured there is because if they made them in new york city they'd be 1500 dollar boots period yeah so you know as much as i complain about their annual price hikes you know thankfully they're still less than a grand and you know what i look at the shoe mart constantly they're selling out they're constantly selling out like oh yeah they're alden is doing great right now shoe mart they're all their batches they're selling through those things man i don't know who out there is buying through every single batch but yeah they are doing just fine but but one thing that i i wanted to touch on in in, in terms of consumer neuroticism right so we're sort of taught this idea that you know we all heard the story our grandpa had one good pair of shoes and he treasured them and he wore them to special occasions and he took good care of them and all this stuff. They last him his lifetime, all this stuff. <clears throat> but our grandpa did not have what we have. What we have today is information. We have endless information. We can make better informed decisions than ever. And we can af afford to make mistakes. We can experiment around. We can size ourselves wrong. We can style ourselves wrong. <laughs> We can accumulate more than we need. We can sell off all of our excess. We can keep learning, obsessing, loving, enjoying, evolving, and appreciating. But what's most important, I think, is that we take time to reflect on and enjoy this journey. Because the fact is, is that leather has been made, it is made all over the world right now. It's made, it's made, there are hundreds, if not thousands of tanneries. They all have a different process. They're, most of them are probably learning based on just their individual interaction with the hide itself that's that's all they have they, they, they didn't they didn't have some book from like antiquity teaching them how to <laughs> some leather bible teaching them how to tan leather it's like no they they had dead animals they took the skin they're like hey we could turn the skin into something but how do we preserve it i don't know use some birch tar oh i don't know use use this use that <laughs> you know use salt get get the hair off i don't know point being you can there are there are thousands of ways to skin a cat and in this case to tan leather people have been doing it all over the world for tens of thousands of years and nowadays we get to get a look finally for the first time in human history probably to finally get a look at what different makers are doing and now start comparing those you know and it's really fascinating to finally get the chance to do it not just compare the leathers but compare boot make Boot, boot building styles or different methods for boot building, different boot patterns, different reasons for the the heel balance and the 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 number of or well yeah the number of leather stacks throughout the midsole, insole, in the heel, you know the the angular arch support, arch. toe spring, heel spring, heel height, yeah, all of it. Exactly. This is the first time in history when we've ever been able to collate all this information in one spot and uh, that's what partially makes it so exciting at the same time so daunting you know because th there's just so many angles to approach it from but yeah yeah everybody can do what aristocrats have only done the last 200 years we look at yeah. like savile road in london yeah you could do what some of what we're talking about but it's only for the upper echelon of society the richest of the rich the people that you know could get into the gentleman club saint john's yeah. or whatever whatever it's called you know right. they, they had the money to shop on savile road yeah this is something everybody can do now to a certain extent yes um you're right that because because here's the thing if we want to talk about inflation and how much stuff has gone up look how, much, how expensive car payments have gotten in the past three years uh, none of we complain about alden their yeah. prices ain't gone up that much true <laughs> Like, like they, they've, they've maintained one pair of Aldens is about a car payment, an average car payment. Yep. That's so that that's some of the reality there. I, I mean, so like, you know, people talk about like, oh, I can't afford this. Oh, I can't afford that. But some of it is th there's still a lot you can afford nowadays. Yeah. Even with the price increases compared to some of the stuff people have to afford now. Once again, it, depending only if if boots run in your blood or are they required for you to live and i mean that very satirically but like you know for a lot of us you know this this is a a, a passion that goes beyond just a hobby yes like there's people that are passionate about boots just like enjoying wearing them and seeing them not a bunch of crazy people that are getting their microscopes out to check out the patina on the internet um 
th- those guys hit a different level of crazy. And then like you get into like someone like my case where like the construction is the most fascinating part. And like, yeah, I can I build a pair of boots by hand? I could not going to turn out very good, but I could absolutely do it. Give me a couple machines. I'd get better. The right number of machines. I might be able to make a decent boot first try, especially if the sat, the last is already ready to go and whatnot. And I have a pattern that I can follow. I could, you know, build one probably first try. You let me lose some Frank shop. I bet you I could come out with a pretty decent pair. Oh, dude, let me, um, let me just tell you, you of all people could build a killer boot on your first try. <laughs> I have no doubt about it. <laughs> and, 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 you, and you might be right. I, I don't know that for certainty, but you might be right on that. And, but the reality is, you know, we, we can take these and we can move forward with them and do stuff with them. Or, you know, we can lean back on the I'm just a consumer. I just consume. And that's fine. But just kind of knowing where you're at on that, like if, if you're just a consumer, right? Yeah. You're going to get two or three of these. That's probably going to be it. You're going to move on to your next pair of Nike Air Force Ones or, you know, whatever. You know, this is no different than sneakerheads, except for, you know, most of us into boots don't just put them on a shelf and never wear them because that's how they maintain their value. Boots are not a resale world. You're, right. you're not going to win with this. There's no drip here. You're, you're, the, the you buying the boots, they have lost value. This is this. We're getting to the car analogy again. Second, yeah. it leaves a lot. It's worth less than it was when it was there. Now, yeah. maybe to you, that's not the case, but to everyone else, that 100 percent is the case. Right. And and that's that's some of the realities of this. So you could get into whatever pieces you really want to, and, and how much it's worth to you is how much the journey is worth to you. Ultimately, at the end of the day, that too. I mean, that's, that's what the stitch true. down patina thunder dumps about, right? The journey of it. Whether whether or not you necessarily agree with it, it has to be a brand new pair of boots or maybe some of the processes are associated with it. And, you know, for some people, they just don't want to, I'm going to use these terms loosely, destroy a good brand new pair of boots. They want to wear them naturally. Obviously, the, the Patina Thunderdome is not for you. Like that's that's clearly right. not, you know, something you want to do. You know, in my case, I'm waiting on my Flora Knights and my Franks and Natural Shinky, and I'm hoping to get both of those in by the late entry. Oh, I don't cool. know... Flora is supposed to have them done by the second. So I should be able to make the November 5th late entry for those. I'm not sure on the Shinkies. I've seen them lasted. They did ask me about the soul and they have the soul. I have not been called yet to know that those are in the mail. So I'm hoping I get yeah. those in time to do that as my second dome pair, but um, oh, cool, it might just man. be, the, it might just be the Flora Knights. Oh, that's awesome. So. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've, uh, you know, we talked about it during our last talk. I, I had a hard time with the stitch down Patina Thunderdome. And I agree, it started to feel sort of marketing, more on the marketing side than on the organic side, but that's inescapable. I've come to this conclusion, like, um, you know, and being in the military, it's kind of the same way, like, you know, to be an officer and to keep getting promoted, you kind of got to get good at politics. And, and you got to play the game. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Yeah. And, and a lot of people, they, they say, well, I'm not made to play the game. I'm made to do my job. And And I get that too. But at the same time, like, yeah, I think at a certain level we should play the game, not not because we're out there to like win it, but just for the sake of like for me, I, I decided to do it again for the for the networking and for the for the community and to sort of form a cohesiveness amongst boot fiends. And uh, well, speaking to what you're talking about in terms of like the stitch down patina thunderdome being geared towards like destroying a pair of boots. So my friend Jen, she used to be Dudette style. She just changed her instagram to patina miles and she's planning we we were just talking this week literally she's planning to start her own patina competition but it's not so much it's not a timed thing it's tracking your boots patina from zero to a thousand miles like because we have all these tracking apps on our phone now we can sort of track how far we've walked and so however long it takes doesn't matter Take your time, enjoy the the journey, and get to a thousand miles and show that progression. And I was really inspired by that, and so I'm glad to I'm glad to talk about it in this video because because yeah, I, I was planning to actually use these Willies, um, monkey boots for that. These are my new Willies in Walpier black. Yeah, it's Black Burrow Butter O. Is which which is the undertone on that? Is that the whiskey? It looks like the whiskey. Yeah, I think it's whiskey. Yes. Okay. And you knew what they for, were. For for, for 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 those of you that don't know me very well on the YouTube channel, I, I am known for kind of like my eagle eye of being able to identify leathers by by it's so embarrassing because I, I actually reviewed these already. And during the review, I'm like trying to figure out which exact leather this was because I'm like, well, wait, some leathers have like a white a white wax on them, some of them have a black wax, some are like 
black beneath some are brown beneath some are natural beneath like i don't know what i'm i can't tell what's going on yep and you just see them <laughs> through it through my crappy mac camera and, and immediately know what they are <laughs> but yeah willie's in a wolfier what, what was yep. it again? The, black borough butter whiskey yeah butero whiskey yes exactly yep. Yeah, and they're on the on a cream. I'm not sure if it's Butero or Buttero. I've I've heard both, and no one's ever corrected me. I'm oh, not yeah. sure. So Rocky Mountain, who's the main Creasy Walloper seller in the United States, calls yeah. it Buttero. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know if it's, it could be it could be Butero. I, I don't know. I I've all, I've always heard from them. They call it Buttero, and I'm assuming they talk to these guys since they they're their main distributor so I, i'm hoping that's how it's yeah. said to them I don't, i'm not sure but they've I've always heard them call it buttero because they're big yeah. sellers the buttero bellies for wallets okay interesting yeah uh, well butero would i guess be the italian pronunciation but buttero would be like the american version either way is correct like i still say for example i still say vibram but apparently the correct pronunciation is vibram but it is it is Vibram, but no one says that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Considering I, most of their sales are in the United States, they're basically a United States company now. Everyone calls it Vibram. So, well, I have a solution to that. If you wanted us to pronounce it Vibram, you could have spelled it that way. You spelled it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> You're Italian. We speak American here. <laughs> exactly. And burro, burro means, well, it means donkey in Spanish. I think it means something else in in Italian, hold on. <laughs> Let me read. Oh, I guess I'm not crazy because burro in Spanish is donkey, but yeah, burro in Italian is butter. Um, talking to Wyatt at the boot camp, he was saying, you know, I was r- really captivated by his runs in burro. He's going to be doing a brass boot as well as the new Garrison boot in burro, and it's it's got that white waxy finish on the outside. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they did it in black and they did it in white. I, I have actually a pair going through Frank's in the black burrow butter or green. I did had the hide for quite a while, but my because I've had a number of orders going through my last, you know, it, it's just, I have a last just for me, but it's it's cool. you know, obviously can go through one boot at a time. I had a rebuild going through, I yeah. had the shinky going through. I think I have blue palisades bison because Michelle was able to get some blue palisades in a very interesting shade of blue palisades I've never seen before. It's oh, a little sure. on the lighter side, a little on the lighter oh. blue, a little more ghosty blue. Really? And, and, and Rikers. Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing a Rikers with white canvas and white Dr. Souls half soles and white stitching across uh, blue palisades. You know those red Balassi Carlo kilties I sent you for the two pair for me and Jeff? Those yeah. are going to be our red, white, and blue boots. No shit. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was that was kind of the thought process behind it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I kept. I don't know what pair I'm gonna put these in, but these are treasures. These are these are lifelong treasures. And l- let me tell you, like, I haven't produced content on these just because, like, th- they're almost too. It's almost too popular. Like they sell themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, like smelling them, th- I can't. It, to me, it smells like a mixture of like coffee grounds and caramel, and I don't know, but it's it's the best smelling leather I have ever smelled in my life, hands down. It's probably the best smell I've ever smelled in my life. Like it, I don't know what they're doing, but this is like absolutely delicious stuff. Like I, I'm, I don't even want to touch it. I just want to keep it on my shelf, like, and just treasure it. <laughs> it's that good. Like it's seriously. Yeah, um, one thing I will say about it is the shell does squeak a little bit for the first, I don't know, 10, 15 wears. It, yeah. since, since it's such a, a glass broad polished finish and it's jack glazed, it yeah. does squeak more than a standard Kilty would. So right. like that's kind of something someone needs to know going into it, which, I mean, you could fix that. Just, you know, wear it once, see where the divots are, and just sand those edges so they're not rubbing against the tongue gusset. And yeah. you could solve that problem real quickly if the squeaking yeah. really bothered you. So that that's like the only one downside I found about them. Besides that, the shell cord and kilties are out of this world. They're, they 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 were a really cool idea. So, yeah, I need to order more, man. Yeah, I can't thank you enough. I told you I've been trying to convince him for two years to run those. I know, I know, <laughs> but you're right. So, and I'm gonna uh, run more. I'm definitely gonna run more, especially. Once I get the insole thing figured out, and once I get some of these other projects like sort of under control, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay heavy into that shell, into the, into those shell kilties because 
they sell and there's no there's no question about it, it people want I'd say the, the, the marble ones are definitely a very cool concept they might be a little wild for some people so i think maybe like ricotta or even maybe some like shinky standard regular shell that's not quite so wild right might, you know also be a good opportunity I'm, I'm not sure like i said i i think the kind of wild coolness of them adds to the coolness factor but like i could definitely see where you know somebody would be like ah you know that's a little too wild for me why don't you just have red or just have green and once again yeah. that's perfectly doable and not not difficult right right I, I can see that and you know like what's really cool is like marbled i, I feel like it's it's hand marbled or almost- it is hand marbled. So, so dirty okay. secret, most tanneries do not have a color guide for how much dye to add to leather. They yeah. do it by hand and by, by look. Yes. So like Horween is one of the better ones at getting a consistent color. And, and, but the yeah. best is hands down wicket and Craig. They, they do the best at getting the same color every time, but you know, Seidel and Ricardo do it by hand. Ricardo, that someone with a sponge literally does that on the back side of the leather. That's why the dye is so strong on the, the reverse side. So really? you flip over to one of the red reverse sides, you can yeah. see that is clearly where the sponge makes contact with the leather. They do it from the back side and let it seep through. Insane. And, and and like I said, it's just one of those things that that someone does it by hand and they get it to where they like it and they leave it alone. It's also why you get so much inconsistency with it. And it's like I yeah. I wouldn't make mar like, like that that sandal and pair you had, they did those by hand to make each one look somewhat the same. Yeah. I would not make boots out of marbled shell quarter. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you're gonna go through a yeah. lot of like setting the perfect pattern down and like a lot of the shell's gonna be wasted. Like like that sandal is done by hand. But like right. sandal I'm, I'm pretty sure they did the finish on that. I don't think they got the hides that way. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, I think they there. There's there's no way they went through so much leather to get like panels that were that close looking together. I almost guarantee they did that. I mean, if they did, they wasted a ton of leather pulling that off. And right. and this comes back to a, a good note. So like that burrow buttero we were talking about earlier, that process of putting that heavy waxing over the ghost leathers, as they call them, because Shiki's done a couple of them as well. There's a name for that. It's called overdyeing. So yes. for a lot of people, what they do is they take what they want and they over the top layer. So if you take someone like Gabard from Creosote who hand dyes 98% of his boots, okay. most of his are in that ghost leather style where he it will be a base color with an over You look oh, at his nine cool. ditches, that is a red boot with a black over You look at his two oh. different colors of fictions, those are a blue or a red undertone with a black over the one he just put out recently is a green engineer with a black over dye. His parlor scoff spray is you picking a base color and him doing a colored pigment over dye in a couple options. It's mostly blacks and some lighter browns, but it's an over dye. And, okay. that, he, and that's just a much longer process of getting to that, like, you know, instead of wax, you're actually wearing dye out of the boots. It's a longer process of getting there. Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah. another sign of a, a, a truly handmade boot is someone that's like, ah, well, Y'all like the color? Let's get the paintbrush out and put some dye on it. <laughs> and talking to my buddy Jimmy, th- that's the conclusion he's come to. He appreciates hand dyed leather now, not so much tannery dyed. Because after talking to Phil, frankly, it, Phil at Ashland Leather, who worked at Horwing, frankly, it's shocking how sort of non codified the process is for tanning Even pants. Yeah, it's 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 almost like they're doing laundry. It's like. Yeah. Okay, throw these hides into the into the drum, yep. and then add these pigments. How much? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and 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 they go through a couple different color stages, and ones that look good, they get tossed into the "I get no more pigment" drum. Ones yeah. that don't get in the "You get more pigment" drum. You know, colors that aren't working out very well quickly become black. Right. <laughs> we, we talked about it earlier. You know, grandpa's shoes, he took care of them. He wore them his whole life. Yeah, because they were black. So he just put another right. layer of paint on them. Exactly. That's essentially what he's doing. I mean, it's military polish. How much more right. gunk can I put on it? Yeah. Right, right. These are both considered Horween Brown Chrome XL. And I could yep. show you some Seidel examples that are. Oh, Seidel the absolute worst about that. <laughs> That's yeah, the like... dirtiest secret of the Pacific Northwest world is Seidel's inconsistency is legendary it's legendary that's why, they, yeah. that's why they make your boots out of a single hide right <laughs> they don't they don't switch the sides before that specific reason yeah because there's no other 
no well, other way to make it happen. Yeah, if, if people wonder how the Patriot is 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 marked so cheap, a huge yeah. portion of that is all of the stuff that made commanders, they make the Patriots out of the leftovers. It's one of the few boots there that is made out of more than one hide. Wow. Interesting. That's, that's one of the things that brings the price down. And then, yeah. you know, he got super creative with uh, letting guys either make up hours after hours or work overtime for a little extra money. Okay. Make the Patriots. Like they, cool. they, he came up with an uh, entire scheme. And then the other thing, too, is like they'll have, they have, a, I think, a round of Mocha coming. So Mocha used to be the most popular work leather. And now it's kind of the redheaded stepchild. They've got a lot of it hanging around. So it's going to probably become a big old run of Patriots. Oh, really? Yeah. Fascinating. I really love that operation that Frank has going on. And it, it's so interesting, you know, the way that the community sort of builds themselves around these different makers. I love to see it. And and speaking to what you were saying earlier about, you know, getting people qualified to make to make boots and and could you make a good boot or not? You know, talking to some of my buddies that make boots, it's like they actually they struggle sometimes to depending on the operation, they struggle to find workers and they're getting people that have never made boots before. Mm -hmm. yes, if you're only doing one task, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like hiring like a like a like a dishwasher at a restaurant. It's like, you don't need skills. You just need to do this, like do this task. That's it. And so, you know, a lot, so a lot of those people end up getting let go, but in terms of like, in terms of keeping up the QC and keeping up the quality, it comes down to the guy at the top or the guy overseeing the the production. Because, Check your foreman, shop foreman. Yeah, exactly. He's, so, he's the start and stop or she if I don't right. know if there is a female shop for me. Maybe there is. A, I'm not sure. I, I'm not aware of yeah. anyone that has one. I mean, once again, it, right. it's kind of like IT. It's a, it's a male dominated industry. You know, there's people that want to work in it, but like, it's funny too, because we, we have this problem at work. You know, they, they have the, the DE and I boards and all that stuff, you know, like, Hey, you know, like how come there's no females on the systems engineering team? Well, yeah. uh, we'll let you know when the first one applies because <laughs> no one's ever applied in the 28 years of this company's history. I don't blame them for not doing it. You know, you work long hours. You don't get paid overtime. You're on call. Right. Why would, you, you want why would anybody it? want to do this? Try to, like, yeah. You know, <laughs> some of us are just stupid and crazy enough to do it in the first place. And out on the street corner with a sign. Hey, any, yeah. anybody interested? I, 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 like, hey, you want to have what looks like a good salary, but work 80 hour weeks and, right. you know, always have to answer the phone when it rings, regardless if it's three in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, hey, I wonder why none of them applied for this. Yeah, I'm getting a it's, little taste of that now, and no, I can tell you, you don't want that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's basically those of us that you know can't have civil conversations with customers that they have to stick yeah. in the back. It's like, well, you guys right. are smart, and we can't trust you to talk to people that actually pay us money. So, <laughs> here, here you go. You're actually so. too smart to talk to normal people, so <laughs> we're not going to have you speaking to normal people. <laughs> well, and partly that's why I want you on, because man you know more than me, like way more than me. And I, I like, in order to keep my content authentic and accurate, I need to have you on my channel, like consistently, because you know, your shit, like, you know, you know, it on such an academic level, you're like the, you're like a professor of boots, you know, and even though you've never made them yourself yet, I would say, you know, I, I've gone to university myself. And I've had professors on different subjects that have never actually worked in the fields but they have doctorates in these fields and it's kind of the same thing it's like so, some of these people they have such an in-depth knowledge that it's actually a disservice to have them working on the ground like you want them actually teaching new generations you know because the amount of information that they have to offer would be wasted on you know on the factory floor for example that said like you know i think if if that was something you wanted to do for a time, I think that would, you'd find it very fulfilling. But at the same time, like, yeah, we almost need guys like you to like, sort of just, just, you know, write books and do podcasts and do talks like this to help educate us. Cause you know, I'm just a guy that I genuinely love leather and I genuinely love making content and wearing these boots and stuff. But like you, you're pushing my knowledge. You're, you're bringing it, you know, incrementally to the next level to the next level and for example i've never heard of a floating heel before until today you know and i've been youtubing about boots for like seven years so there you go 
<laughs> hey, we'll all get up this hill if I got to push you the whole way. It, it yeah. might be a journey for Sisyphus, but we'll get there. I, I need to Eventually. have it on like, like four times a year at least, you know? <laughs> I, people might get annoyed with me at four times a year, but I, I, I mean, it's one of those things like, like if people ever wonder the why, right? Yeah. Uh, Chris of the W hit oh, me yeah, up on yeah, Instagram yeah. asking about another boot talk at some point. And I mentioned this one about heels and I explained, oh yeah, yeah I, I remember seeing that, the wraps that his wife made for you. On the yes, cups. yes. Um, and then I mentioned that yeah. like, you know, the problem with the heel talk is like, I can type it out and like an Instagram post. And that's kind of really the majority of the information, unless you want to kind of get a little bit into the history or kind of like why someone would choose short of aesthetics, one heel versus the other. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he's also in IT as well, but in IT, the concept of I have to be able to take something that I've never done before mm -hmm. and do it perfectly the first time. Yeah. This is, this is why you have guys who can learn the ins and outs of it with never doing it because I'm expected to do it the first time with no downtime no client impact and no loss of revenue to the business, regardless of how Herculean of a task it is, or if I need to be Zeus himself to pull it off, figure it out. What are my options? In many cases, you do need to be Zeus himself to pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then that's, that's kind of where all of this runs together. Well, and for that, I'm super thankful that you took so much time today to talk with me and I'm going to get this thing edited. We have less than a minute. So let's try I saw to it. click over. Yep. <laughs> Mike, I can't thank you enough, my friend. I can't wait to have you on again. Let's figure out a new, a new talk for next time. But for now, this has been fascinating. I've learned a ton. Thank you so much. And I know that the boot community is just going to eat it up. Thanks so much. You have a great night. I'll, I'll talk to you next time. <laughs> yeah, me too. Enjoy everybody. Later, man.